let me welcome you uh, to our first talk uh, in the new series we established in the Max Kade Center for European and German Studies on new works in European history. Um, so we're trying to discuss some of the most exciting new works that we found, and this is definitely one of them. Um, we have a few things planned this semester, but not much yet. We're still working on it. Uh, one thing I can already announce for the future is a talk actually at the end of April with uh, uh, Benedict Savoie, Savoie um, who uh, will speak uh, about art restitution. She just wrote a big report on restitution of African cultural heritage, and she works in Germany and in France, and will actually speak in German. Oh. An exclusive audience. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very, very excited to have her uh, with us. Um, and there will be other events. Uh, there is also a Central European History Seminar that, that we are having and where, where various people uh, also working on German history are going to present and what I will present next week. Um, so um, if, if you're interested generally in our events, uh, you can also si sign up for our list. Um, so uh, in terms of the format, before we start, uh, We've, I, I think there are some people here who have done our web, been, been participating in our webinars before. Um, this is a very peculiar format, uh, which we found very productive. Um, as some of you just heard, we, we experimented with it uh, starting in spring, um, not knowing how to translate our usual in-person events to, to Zoom. And uh, so what we have is an event where you only see our three faces. Um, we have a very brief presentation by our honored guest. Then you hear a few uh, questions from uh, the two moderators, and then you can participate. So even though we cannot see you and you cannot see each other, uh, if you post your questions in the Q&A section below, um, uh, then, uh, then we will try to ask your question. Um, we will also attribute it to you uh, unless you uh, instructors to do otherwise. Um, so uh, that is our format. Uh, so uh, what I can tell you about each other is, is that you're a wonderful group of people who uh, will largely actually know each other, I believe, um, uh, with uh, also many, uh, many Habsburgists here. Um, so uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll We'll pass on the baton to, to my colleague, Emily Grebel, who will uh, do the introductions to our team. Excellent. So it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Dominique Ryle, who's the Associate Professor of Modern European History at Miami University. Uh, that's the one in, at the University of Miami, that's the one in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Dominique's first book uh, is called Nationalists Who Feared the Nation, uh, and it looks at activists in 19th century Venice and Trieste in Dalmatia who imagined a multinational world and offered an alternative to the increasingly powerful concept of a nationalizing state. Um, that book became very well known as part of a sort of generation of scholarship that challenged the idea that we actually know what nationalists wanted or how or what kind of world they were imagining and showed how they had diverse political and economic goals. Um, if you don't know it, it's, it's a fun book. You should read it. Um, she's today going to be talking about her second book, which is called The Fiume Crisis, Life in the Wake of the Habsburg Empire. Um, over the last 10 years, she has won numerous grants uh, to support her research um, on both of these projects. And just a few of those are ACLS and the Mellon and Fulbright and the very prestigious Rome Prize. Uh, she's also, for those of you here who are graduate students, I see we have quite a few of our graduate students, um, kind of built a whole world of sort of support systems for graduate students and postdocs uh, through her work as an editor at a series at Purdue University Press, uh, as an editor for five years of contemporary European history, 
uh, as an associate editor at the American Historical Review. She has single-handedly invented and then figured out how to fund prizes for articles and prizes for graduate students and um, really has been such a champion of the next generation at a time when I think we, we've seen a lot of retrenchment. So we, we thank you, Dominique, and we commend this great work. And we're super excited to have you here today talking about the Fiume crisis, life in the wake of the Habsburg Empire. So I turn it over to you. Okay, well, first, thanks for single-handedly my arsh. <laughs> I think, you know, I've been working with Emily so intensely in so many different ways about trying to make the fields we love have a future, um, a future that we got. And, and, you know, I'm really happy to be here because I love this emphasis on dialogue. So this is not a normal book, book talk. You know, I, I usually grown on for a longer time. I'm just gonna talk for about 10, maybe 12 minutes um, and give you just a little bit about what this book is trying to do and, and what it looks like. But this is not me, you know, giving you the, the, the Cliff Notes version of what the book is. It's actually for the dialogue, which is the most important part of our job is dialogue. So anyways, this is the book and this is the name of the book. I see a lot of people who know this story already in the audience. And Martha Shulman is not allowed to ask a question. Uh, she's the person who's read this probably manuscript more than anyone. But if you, if, you, if you don't know where Fiume is, if you've ever heard of Fiume, you probably don't know of it because of this, which is, uh, sorry, uh, Rieka. Um, so it, it's today, it's called Rieka. Rieka means river, Fiume means river. This is the river they're talking about. It is the third largest city in today's Republic of Croatia. It is on the Adriatic in the northeasternmost quadrant. And why do I call it the Fiume crisis instead of the Rijeka crisis? Is because it's not about the entire city of what is today Rijeka. On the other side of this river is this place called Sushak, which used to be its own city. Um, controlled by Croatia, Slavonia in the time period that I'm looking at in this book, which is right after World War I, so from 1918 to 1921. I instead study Fiume, which used to be a semi-autonomous city-state in the Habsburg Hungarian Kingdom. I know this is a lot of information if you don't know Habsburg history, and it's not any information if you do know Habsburg history. So just know that I'm trying to do 17 jobs at the same time. Why I'm emphasizing this is there is usually arguments about calling this town Rieka or calling it Fiume, about what is the identity of the city? Is this an Italian city? Is this a Croatian city? And a lot of that is stemming from the, the subject of the book itself, the crisis, the crisis when the Habsburg Empire dissolves. I am only looking at what was this, this semi-autonomous port city that, um, was the ninth largest industrial port in continental Europe before World War I began. And I'm trying to understand what is wrong with how we think of it, if you ever do. Now, if you've never been to Croatia and you don't care about the region, you've never heard any of this before. But you might have heard of Fiume, and it's either because of this, the diplomatic history of the Paris Peace Conference, Fiume is the trigger for the only walkout of one of the Entente powers. The Entente powers are the winners of, of World War I. Um, in which in April 1919, the Italian delegation leaves Paris and before the signing of the Versailles Treaty and figuring out what's going to happen to Germany or figuring out what's going to happen to the Middle East or figuring out what's going to happen to Poland. Um, over this question of who's going to get this town, the town's 50,000 people. So it's a kind of a weird story, but if you ever buy a book that's about the peace treaty, there will be a lot of pages about this town. But even more likely is this, this thing, which is this guy, Gabriele D'Annunzio, who, not my favorite human, but he, he very, very important after World War I. He's a 
He's a famous decadent poet. He was already a celebrity before the war. But what he did during the war is really different than most people. And as in his 50s, he, he volunteered and was the oldest uh, officer in the Italian army during World War I. And he really became the, 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 the voice of pride in being in the military and being in the war. Instead of everyone who's angry at being in the war because everyone's dying and everyone's getting poor and Italy wasn't doing a great job at this war, he was your PR man. He was the, the living embodiment of paid for by the Italian army, trying to explain why World War I was a great idea. And he, he, you'll see here, it says fiume, fiume, fiume. After World War I, he coins this very famous phrase that if you've ever read a textbook of European history, you've heard the mutilated victory, this vision of being cheated after World War I um, and that the victory that they'd had had been mutilated by the corrupt influence of di diplomats and Jews or whatever, he, they use that phrase for lots of things. He goes in September 1919 and takes over this town of Fiume with 200 to 300 followers to show the stuff sh shirts in Paris that they don't make history, men do. A couple of women join them too. To be really honest, the dipl diplomacy story is really important for people who study what the relationship is between the making of international law and grassroots anger movements. But deep down, the only reason why it's so important is because this then happens afterwards. So in some ways, really, if you ever heard about Fiume and you've never heard of Lieka, it's because of this guy who came in on this red convertible Fiat on September, 9th, September 12th, 1919. And took over a town without a single shot being fired with women kissing him and flowers getting thrown at him and stayed there for almost 15 months until he finally uh, gets kicked out. So this thing Fiume is a great story. It's fun to tell fun stories, but it's usually told because it supposedly means a lot. And what it really means to most historians is this idea of proto-fascism, of, the, of the, the story that explains how, what are the ingredients that Mussolini knows how to use to do what he does? And a lot of it, it's about the famous guy talking from the balcony, but more of it is about his followers, the legionnaires, these veterans, these misfits, these angry guys, they kind of are willing to follow the man and create this esprit de corps of kind of being bad. Um, this is says fume or death. They are the followers of Denuncio. They're not, they, not one political ideology, not one thing, which also fits in very well with early fascism, right? So there's republicanism, monarchism, syndicalism. There's a whole bunch of things in fascism at the beginning. And, and this, this seems to really emblematize what Mussolini does. He gets the guys. The other thing that makes it a very easy story for telling with proto-fascism is how it ends. It's really a revolt against the liberal state. It's really about Italians saying the Italian state is not the nation. And it, it ends in December 1918, which then once again very famously calls the Christmas of blood, even though very few people died. There's a lot of blood, but whatever, poet. Uh, it is a situation in which a country is bombing a town to make it stop calling itself part of that country. And so you start really wondering what is nationalism and what is the state and what is the relationship between the nation, the state and the nation state. And if you're thinking about Mark Mazower and you're thinking about liberalism and interwar violence, this fits in incredibly well with the failure of the liberal project of kind of controlling the populist project. How can you not do this? They're both bald. So you, 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 you get, you get D'Annunzio and the Legionnaires equals the successful model of political activism that then Mussolini does for his March on Rome. Much more a media circus than a circus. But one way or the other, th there's too much in here that makes sense. Strangely enough, it's also a very popular story in the ex-Yugoslav context, in a different way. In a way of Fiume was a multicultural town. It was what is today Rijeka. It was filled with Slavic speakers, Slovene, Croatian, a bunch of other languages too. And look at what D'Annunzio did. He's doing this ethnic cleansing, this erasure of a, of a Croatian or Slovene or Yugoslav presence already before fascism. 
And so just as Italian historiography and Western historiography on the beginnings of fascism use uh, Denuncio as this kind of very key case, strangely enough, we're talking about chauvinism, extreme nationalism, and uh, xenophobia on the Adriatic, it also serves as the same lesson. And when these two sides that never agree on anything agree about something, already you need to start studying it. So this is part of a long historiography of fascism. All the most famous guys, and most of them are guys, but there's some women too, who work on fascist, Italian fascism, have chapters and chapters, look at the index, then one says everything. But there's also this new global historiography that started to take over this Fiume story because, you know, to call things globe, you kind of have to do things that are not just in Paris. And one of the things they add in is Fiume. So Gervat's book on World War I Never Ended has an entire chapter on Fiume and Pankai Michel's entire introduction of Age of Anger, which is about Trump didn't start yesterday, or as Johnson's been around as a model for a long time, um, is fuming. They're using those old historiographies, but they're trying to use this case, this weird story, as something that is a global story that starts in this town in 1919. It's a weird story to use for fascism. Uh, I saw that Alison Frank Johnson is, is here. I think at one point she's like, um, this doesn't look like fascism to me. You know, we've got these nudist aviators who are libertarians who think that you should sleep in trees and only eat vegetables. You have half of the time them like creating magazines called yoga and having all the futurists there. And one of the most famous books about this time period, so the 15 months where they're there is called the, 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 the party revolution. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's described as Woodstock. And, and so when you're trying to think about fascism, you're like, you know, when I'm trying to talk about the origins of fascism, I don't think about the bathing beauties at the beach. So what is, why is this connected? It's even weirder if you think of how little violence there is, right? So the, the march in the red convertible with all the flowers and the ladies kissing him, no shot fired. Uh, the end of this whole thing, the Christmas of blood, less than 50 people dead. So calling this the origins of fascism, I think is actually really creepy because it starts making fascism look like it's not a violent story. And if you know, most of us here study it, uh, we all know the beginnings of fascism are very, very violent and that this kind of stuff is not necessarily how we should be. So how have historians who are not dumb people who've been writing all these books about Denuncio, what do they do with this problem of not, there not being any violence? What they do is this, they look at charisma. They look at the power of ideas and words, the power of the media, the power of celebrity, the power of the man, the power of populist nationalism. This is Denuncio. This is not in Fiume, by the way, this is in Genova. But one way or the other, it's this idea of the swarming followers where he says something and all of a sudden everyone's repeating it. But somehow people seem to forget that the town of Fiume is not made up of the followers. It's not Genova, it's Fiume. And Fiume is over 50% not identified as mother tongue Italian. Although multilingualism, I saw Ivan Yelichich is on this call and he has amazing, amazing work on showing the high degree of multilingualism that's going on in Fiume. But even if we're not looking at multilingualism, the, the majority of the town does not think of itself as a mother tongue Italian speaker. 13% Hungarian, 26% Croatian, 5% Slovene, 5% German. During World War I, they were fighting against Danuncio. So are his speeches about how disgusting the Austrians and the Germans are and we should be so proud for how many we killed? He's talking about killing them. And he's doing it, quoting Dante here and Mazzoni there and whatever to a, a public that some of them might be totally into it, but many, many others of them are coming from backgrounds, heritages, and you know, valorizations that are completely different. Not only that, this is a town of newcomers. This is a boom town. 60% of the town arrived in the last 20 years before World War I, from all over, some from Italy, some from the Adriatic, but most from the Kingdom of Hungary, but most from Eastern Europe, but most from the Balkans. So thinking that D'Annunzio, already it's questionable if he's gonna brainwash all Italians in the world, but thinking that Fiume, there's so little violence in Fiume because of the poet, 
the poems, is a little strange. So this is the central question of the book. If Fiume was so ethnically diverse, why didn't it turn into the bloodbath of the Baltics or Macedonia or Ukraine? Why, why does this story of the paramilitary not turn into the bloodlands or the shatter zones of empire? And if you think it's because of Danunzio's followers, look at these guys. These are not the peacekeeping force that are gonna explain why there's no bloodbath. This is how they want to represent themselves. Scary Vanity Fair-esque thugs. So, so really just thinking about what it means, why isn't there violence? And that, that's basically what happened to me in this book. I came in to repeople the history with the town that wasn't Italianissima, that wasn't the most Italian. But then I found myself trying to figure out, well, if it's so diverse, then, then, then why, do they, why are they complicit? Why isn't there violence? Why isn't there a revolution? The, on the left is my sloppy writing and how I thought of this book. I think I wrote it in 2011, 2012. And on the right is how Harvard helps reframe it. But one way or the other, what it turns into is there's a lot of work going on on a state level to make sure there isn't violence. There's a lot of incentives, promises, uh, continuations that make it so this, this mixed up place in a time of enormous confusion and chaos doesn't turn into a revolution, doesn't turn into a bloodbath. What I found was the imperial ghost state. What I found was the Habsburg monarchy that was not continued out of pride and loyalty, but was used, manipulated, changed, shifted, uh, a very uh, utilitarian version of what are we keeping and what are we leaving. So uh, I'm going to end pretty much now in one second, but it looks at, uh, the, there's an introduction, there's a first chapter of everything you're supposed to know about Pume, but clearly you don't because no one knows anything about this, but thinks they do. do. And then a chapter on what is money in a world after empire, what is law? When you're legal, when you're when the state that made it is gone, what is uh, citizenship? Who's in? Who's out? Who has rights? When no one, you get to determine it on your own in a moment of total confusion. And what what, what are you? Where, where do you sit in the world? How do you want to think of yourself about language laws and name changes and and education propaganda? And and then I have a very short conclusion. Basically saying this, that the, the central argument of the book is there is political nationalism. This is no world of the indifferent. This is a world of political nationalism. But that's not the only story that's going on here. And there are a lot of, there's a context to why this political nationalism plays out the way it does. And I see it as a consolidation of certain aspects of the imperial world that are now actually getting hemmed up and, and I did not write this book because of my long love of everything Rieka. I wrote it because I think it's very easy to do a story about what's a state after an empire by using the smallest state, 50,000 people. One little lady like me can't do Poland, can't do three empires into one. One little lady like me can't do Yugoslavia even more complicated. So Fiume is more like, what do these states have to face? Obviously they all do it in different ways. They also have, most of them have much more complicated situations than Fiume does. But they're, they, it's, a, it's a kind of a test case of moving away from political history as the history of the inner war. And the Thank you, thank you so much for that that wonderful introduction to the to the book, um, and I love that last that well not the last slide but the, the slide where you have your what I wanted to do and what I will do. This is this is what goes into all the right the papers of authors. You know, you know do you keep that <laughs> for your nafla. I took a picture because I'm like, I wonder if this is what it's going to be like. <laughs> And it's great also, and it shows perhaps uh, those of you who haven't read this absolutely fabulous book, and so much of what is so great about this book is really in the writing and in, in, the, in, the, in the very concreteness of all these examples uh, that deal with questions of currency, uh, questions of flags and how you get a flag when there's not enough material around to make them, um, schooling, um, name changes. Uh, there, so there's, there's, there's 
in all of these case studies that that sort of come up in that table of contents that that you could briefly see there uh, really make the book the book. Um, and as you said, because it is also a, a departure in some ways from a political history to to a new social history. Um, the the question I want to open us up with is nevertheless a bit of bring you back to the politics of it, which is which is still the framing, right? You did it yourself right now, um, and it's a framing that that asks us if, if I can sort of reframe the reframing. <laughs> um, it's uh, um, an, an attempt to draw us away from taking that moment as what will come after it simply. It's not just proto-fascism that doesn't look like we want, like we expect it to look like. Uh, it is also the history of something that came before um, and that is an empire. So, um, I mean, I'm very interested in what makes that that narrative possible historiography in, in terms of historiography, what in, in the writing of history and, and what we professional scholars do allows us to write that. But I also want to already throw in a bit of a, a question about that. <laughs> um, uh, and that is you, um, Emily mentioned your, your book that asks us to, to rethink what nationalists really wanted. And, and, and we also have a, quite a few challenges to what is an empire uh, in, in, in historiography. And when it comes to the empire you're dealing with that is, uh, that is creating this uh, separate city state with some autonomy that sort of peters out towards 1913 and <laughs> gets revived, uh, then it's, it's and, and you mentioned this also, it's, it's sort of the Habsburg empire, but it's actually the kingdom of Hungary. And that Hungarian state really, really wants to be national, one might say. <laughs> uh, right? In terms of name changes since the 1880s, you also mentioned this in the book, there are these pressures to change your names, uh, to sound more Hungarian. Uh, the state tries to centralize as best as it can. Like many places that we can call empires, it's not always that good at it, but it definitely, it's not, not for lack of trying. <laughs> um, so, so my question is how we deal with that in this history of saying, Fiume is not just proto-fascist in this moment after World War I, it is also post-imperial. Um, is there more of a continuity in a sense there, um, where it's not just post-imperial, it's post-empire trying to be nation state? <laughs> um, so, so I'm wondering about what, what in historiography makes this shift possible that you're doing, but then, but then also thinking about how stark can we actually make this differentiation between before 1918, after 1918, empire becomes first post nationalizing empire and then gets sucked up in this bigger story of just nation and, and fascism? Well, I mean, it's an impossible question, but it, it's a it's a really, it lets me say what, what I started getting fascinated by when trying to understand this history, which is Hungary. Um, because you know, I teach nationalism for undergraduates, and I and I talk about Hungary as this kind of model of trying to make a nation state in the 19th century. And I always thought about all the nationalizing, centralizing impulses of the Hungarian state, the, ha the Hungarian part of the Habsburg Empire, and I never really thought about Croatia, Slavonia. I never thought about Fiume. I never thought about how what's happening in the Austrian half of the Habsburg monarchy at the end of, the, of, of its existence is moving towards federalism. While with Ausgleich, with dualism, with 1867, Hungary is stuck with autonomy. Hungary is stuck with Croatia, Slavonia that has its own laws, that has its own tax code, that has its own Heimatfecht thing, that has its own, own, own thing. And I never thought of it because the Croatian story is always about oppression and nationalization and trying to centralize and trying to take away their right to being 
a kingdom and their right to everything. And I didn't think about Fiume because Fiume is 50,000 people. And strangely, even while I was writing the book, it took me a long time to realize that the kingdom of Hungary is a centralizer. It is a nationalizer, but what it's living is a federation of kingdoms or of city states that it's trying to get rid of at the same time as the Austrian story is the opposite. And so I never really thought of it in those ways. And also the other part of the story and, and there's these wonderful new historians of Hungary. I mean, this is a field that is going to, I think, really change how we tell a lot of these stories. It's, it's, it's shifting, new work is coming out all the time, is, is showing us, for example, using Fiume, how it is the kingdom of Hungary that actually Re strengthens Fiume's autonomy with dualism with 1867 in order to keep it out of Croatia, Slavonia. So in order to create their little Hong Kong on the Adriatic, they, uh, they literally create a system they then 15 years later, 20 years later, want to take away. So you, you, you start thinking, What's, what, what are they trying to do at the beginning? What are they trying to do at the end, 1867 to 1914? And I, I now am very excited about this period. I mean, my next book is on this period um, of thinking about Hungary, not just as the nationalizer, but also as a federal state that has, didn't just suffer federalism because that's what they got, not just with Austria, but with its underlings but also one that strengthen, strengthened it at the beginning in order to make money. So I, I'm trying to figure this out. I don't know, it, to, to answer your real question, which is how is post-empire and pre-fascism the same story? Well, I think in the case of Fiume, it is the same story because without the, the, the consolidation, there wouldn't have been the oxygen to have Danuncio stand from a balcony and we all just look at him. Because what we would be seeing is like the Hungarian revolution in Budapest or what's happening in Munich or the Bolshevik revolution somewhere else. So what would have happened in Fiume if we didn't have these conservative forces that are trying to calm everybody down is we would have have what we have so many other parts of after World War I, which would not have allowed that for those fun stories of the nudist aviators and the guy in the in the convertible, we would have had nightmare stories in which Paris Peace Conference would have been forced to do something. And they would have done it for Fiume because it was a moneymaker, it was part of global trade, it, not because they cared about people dying, they let people die everywhere, but they, they cared about the gangs and they cared about Fiume, and there's a reason. It's not because they were multi-ethnic cities, it's because they were poor. Wonderful, thank you for that. We're already starting to get some questions in the Q&A, so if anybody has one, you can feel free to post it. Uh, Dominique will read your questions, Ari and I will to put them together <laughs> around themes. I mean, she'll read them later, but I mean, right in, in live time, uh, we wanna keep her moving. So we'll read and, uh, and structure and make sure that they sort of keep going in a normal conversation. I will right. say that picture of the nudists reminds me a little bit of the Lake of the Ozarks last uh, May when they had all of those like <laughs> semi topless people in the middle of the pandemic. I remember that. Boats that sunk. Um, but I have a question for you to sort of picks up on this idea of kind of the end of empire and that part of your story. Um, one of my favorite chapters of this book, it will come as no surprise, is the part on law. <laughs> and the ways that you talk about, you introduce this framework of multi-sovereignty, which I find really interesting. We often hear in the 19th century, people are talking about quasi-sovereignty or semi-sovereignty. I see Amy Janelle is here. She writes on that. Um, you know, but here you're talking about this kind of post-imperial multi-sovereignty and sort of the undoing of empire at the exact same time that new systems are being layered on top. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the complexity of this legal pluralism and also what it meant. You have such great stories for people's everyday lives, the ordinary person. What did it mean to them to have kind of this complex and confusing legal system? Um, what is it? Did it create a situation where crime loses its meaning? Does it have different meaning? Does crime mean something different to the people who are arriving than the people who are there? Um, I wonder if you could talk a little more about that. 
So in the book, I try and show that this idea of having many layers of laws is not new. It's one that is already existent in the Habsburg lands, um, and it's particularly existent in Fiume. And it's something that there's that the elites of this town, or, or anyone who's reading the laws, is trying to win, not by getting out of it, but by getting a little bit more of an upper hand. So I, I try and describe this this kind of tripod that uh, between the empire, the Hungarian kingdom, and Fiume, the the city state. And so what happens when, when two of the three legs are gone, does that mean freedom? No, they don't even want that. They, they just want whatever they can get in that tripod system with some new pods. Uh, so, so what I try and describe in the book is that they're trying to create out of this moment of chaos enough of, a, uh, of, a, of an anchor to not lose their pod while they go looking for a new body, right? So they're, they're, like, they're, 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 they're like those crabs that are looking for the new, for the bigger shell. They're looking for a new shell to, to be in and make sure that they don't get eaten up. And so when, when, they're, when, when they're pushing for Italy, how they're describing Italy is not how most Italians would see Italy. And, and, and they get kind of obsessed with uh, the Republic of San Marino, which is this little city state in the middle of the Italian peninsula which uh, has its own currency and its own postal system and all this stuff, but it also is in Italy. So it takes advantage of all of the, what being in a state has, you know, red, red roads and railways and you know, social services. So, so this is what we're going on. But what life on the ground is like is that people are trying, what I see is a bunch of people going, which, which of the versions of the law is going to help me more? <laughs> so this enormous legal literacy of people you wouldn't expect to know, right? And, and, and a lot of the people that are in the law chapter are literate. So in the money chapter, there's a lot of people that are illiterate. In the citizenship chapter, there are a lot of people that are illiterate. In the law chapter, you get people, manip most of the people who are trying to manipulate the system do have a legal literacy beyond uh, beyond just being acted upon by the laws. But you also have a state trying to sell its new version. And so they create, and I, I, I think that this is fairly con common in transitioning regimes, where if the new laws are more, everyone, if you commit a crime, you are held to the law in place when you committed it. But if the new laws are more lenient, you get the new laws. If the new laws are less lenient, you get the old laws. It's almost like trying to like buy this car and after 30 days, if you don't like it, you know, you can take it back. It's kind of that's how this living, the multiple system is playing out is which one of those is better asking around. So, so it's, uh, it's, it doesn't feel like it's about identity. It feels like law is about ordering your disorder. A lot of crime is going on. Crime rates are exploding at this time. Um, the jails are full because people are desperate. There's just a lot is going on right now. And so also, when do you push a law to be uh, respected and when do you don't becomes the question. I don't really talk about it that much in the book. But it is something that you can see in the in the archives. And if anyone wants to write an article on that, Yume's archives, if you're interested in criminality and law, you're gonna find a lot. It's it's really quite fascinating. I don't know if I answered your question, but I tried to. No, that was great. Thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna we're gonna go to some of the QA, but I, I wanna sure. follow up on some of the stuff, especially with like mixed marriage and the laws of pertinency, <laughs> but we'll get to that. <laughs> Well, so because I I would love to just give a uh, mention a question here from from our, from the Q and A section, and perhaps perhaps add add, add a, an additional sort of comment to it because it fits so well with with the discussion we're just having about the law and 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 sort of if you want particular version of forum shopping in this in this in this situation, and uh, so this question comes from my colleague uh, Helmut Smith. Um, uh, um, let me, let me, so he, he uh, speaks about the absence of violence, the question that you raised as the central question of the book. And he says, I remember addressing a similar question 
in The Butcher's Tale, a book, uh, a book, uh, so his book, The Butcher's Tale, in a chapter that might have been called Why Wasn't Konitz Yet Vabna? And give Vabna to those. Right. Yeah, right. So, why was there no mass slaughter of Jews? I also remember that the part that I couldn't figure out to my own satisfaction concerned the internal, internalization of the rule of law. But simply, if there was no police and no army, would it have become Yedvavne and the mass slaughter of Jews? I answered no, but never felt sure. I wonder how you would answer it with respect to Fiume. And perhaps just to, answer, to, to also connect it to the discussion you just had, right? I mean, we do have this understanding of the law well, this is starting with, if you want, early modern legal theory too, and, and previous. I mean, the law is there to avoid vengeance and other forms of, of violence, ultimately. Um, and there's a psychological investment that we're presuming about the law that makes it this function. But how does that change in the type of legal environment you're describing? Um, do we need to adapt our, our theories about what the law does to violence? Um, and perhaps it's not the law. I mean, Hamlet actually left it open. Maybe that's actually not the answer. But, but, but to what degree does does the law and the particular type of law we're seeing here, and the pick and choose type of law we're seeing here, not just for the individual, but actually for the semi-sovereign <laughs> state national council, um, how does that apply to to this to this larger set of questions? Uh, well. There, there is violence in Puma. There's just less than we would expect. And so maybe a way to answer that question is to think, well, when is there violence? And there are two moments of, of, of nationalist, um, you know, what you would expect. And that's when D'Annunzio is there. And it's very, anyone who knows Italian history knows this. There were some Italian soldiers that were hurt and split in the summer of 1920. And it turned into a series of anti-Croatian, but actually anti-Slav uh, uh, manifestations all along the Adriatic. So in, in Trieste, in Pula, um, in, throughout Istria, and also in Fiume. So what does that mean? There were nationalists in Fiume before. These are not, this isn't, they didn't come in the summer of 1920. It's when D'Annunzio and the, the, the powers that be decided to be part of the movement against the Croats. And so you have the burning of, the, the, uh, of a, the, an office and you have uh, a, 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 a Croatia, uh, stores that have Croatian names and their signs uh, being uh, persecuted, but you didn't have it a couple months before and you don't have it a couple months later. So what's the difference? The difference is that the powers that be are letting it happen. And if, if anything, encouraging it. So, so does the state matter? Of course it matters. Also, there's, there's been a longstanding uh, treatment of Fiume as the smaller Trieste. And so Trieste's historiography and Trieste's history, which is very linked up with the beginnings of fascism, um, kind of all, always been told as the same story. Well, they're not the same story at all. Trieste is run by the Italian military government and is immediately, almost immediately at the peace talks is seen as it's gonna be part of Italy. It's only contested by those who don't want it to be, but in, in terms of international law, it's pretty clear it's going. So what Fiume is living and how its government is run and how its laws are run, they're still dealing with post-imperial and there's a lot of work about how they transition from Habsburg legal codes and Habsburg citizenship codes and what do they do with the money. They are also a successor state. Italy is also a successor state, but you have a totally different government. One that is a nationalist Italian government. And there's a lot more violence in Trieste than there is in Fiume. So, it, it, it's a story that that you you have so many cases that every place is different, obviously. But what we're seeing in Fiume is is the people from before are basically still the ones in charge, the the local elites, and they're continuing practices from before. And and in these and when there is violence, it's when they're not. So I don't know if that completely answers. You you can never completely answer it. But why has this ha not even been seen? Why haven't we been talking about this? It's because we've been trying to answer 
how fascism in looking after World War I, instead of seeing people in the times they're living where fascism isn't the question yet. I have a question that really picks right up on that, Dominique, which, um, you know, you're talking about how you have sort of continuity over time of these same people. And yet in, now I'm going to get to your pertinency, <laughs> in talking about sort of new citizenship laws and in talking about residency permits, you have some really evocative stories about people who sort of lose their rights. Um, and you talk about how, you know, having the rights, it's not quite citizenship pertinency, the, the rights within the city, it leads to different kinds of social welfare benefits and employment opportunities. Um, and that they are trying to sort of shape who's, you know, in the in-group and who's in the out-group. And we see especially a number of women through marriage sort of falling on one side or the other because their own pertinency and citizenship sort of becomes aligned with their spouses. I guess the question I would have is what's the point, right? To connect it to the violence, what's the point of creating these out groups or in groups? Um, could, and you talk about this in the book, um, you know, is there, what are they trying to do? Is the long-term goal to remove the Slavs? Is it, is there an underlying ideological mission? Is it about sort of deciding who gets to have these perks because there seems something like a little bit of a sort of conflict between the idea that you have this kind of continuity of the people making the decisions and then starting to decide the people who they once included are now pushed out um, and I, I'd love to hear more about your thoughts on that um oh obviously it's who's the they that's it's just the most the hardest thing to not to, to answer this question perfectly, I would say that they don't really care who's a Slav or not. They care about who's who's going to keep on saying they're a Slav. So, I mean, you you know these places. Everyone's mixed up. They're all you know, <laughs> you're Italian. No, you're a Slav. I mean, this doesn't. This is not. But there are people who refuse to be called Italians, and they want to be called Croatians, or they want to be called Slovenes, or they want to be called Yugoslavs. And those people need to get out. So it, is this a, a, a thing about Italian, everyone has to be Italian now? No, not everybody has to be Italian. Does, do we not need people say this is Rijeka, not Fiume? Yes, this is definitely a goal is to get rid of people saying, calling it Rijeka and not Fiume. Um, why even do it? I think that's a great question. I love that question. And I think what I, I think it's, it, it answers two things. First, I, I end in 1921. Fiume actually keeps on going to an independent city state until 1924. I stopped in 21 because I thought it just becomes way too much of a Fiume story and is no longer really that useful for talking about what new states do after the empires are gone. I mean, it, it just, and why does it change? It changes once the international opinion of where Fiume should sit is made, then the activism that's going on in the town isn't about trying to influence the outcome of where do they sit on the map. A lot of the consolidation techniques of who's in and out is actually about growing the populace that has rights. So before 1918, 70% of the people who lived in the town lived there absolutely legally with all rights to going to schools and going to the hospital and doing everything, but were not, le they did not have the rights to be there. They had the permission to be there. In this, these, these diplomatic uh, moves that they make going, now that the empire is gone, we are independent. And with our independence, we want to annex ourselves to Italy. They seem pretty in, 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 improbable because they are only 30% of those 50,000 people have what we would call citizenship. So they just, they do, just like women's suffrage, they give women the right to vote, not because there's this big women's movement in the town, it's they need to up their numbers. So part of it is about social engineering and trying to keep revolution at bay. You need to give people ration cards. You need to let them go to the hospital with all their syphilis cases. You need to do all this stuff or else you're gonna have a revolution. But a lot of it is also to make them look like a state. A lot of this book is useful for thinking about the success of states because none of these are states yet, right? None of these are self-proclaimed national councils trying to like 
lion that roared it to the roar. So, so, so how you look like a state starts becoming a big issue. And I think that that's also a lot of what's going on. They also, one last thing, they don't really reject as many of these applications as they just don't answer them. And I think that's fascinating. They're just, they're like, we'll see how it goes. They answer the ones they wanna give it to. So if you're a real Italian nationalist and you're rich, you're gonna be fine. The others, I have to take, you know, paperwork takes forever. Thank you, that was just really interesting. Ari, did you wanna jump in? I am, I, yeah, I mean, perhaps um, the, the various questions also on, on Q&A that, that sort of point more towards the future again. And, and perhaps I, I can take up some, the gist of some of it also by, by, by asking about, about the proto-fascism part again, that some people were, were wondering about what, what proto-fascism we think is supposed to look like um, as, as, as one question, what were actually our assumptions about it. Um, but then also there is the, the, the end of the story seems to be an incorporation into a nation state. But then, but then Italy also, just like Hungary, has the ambitions to be, <laughs> lives empire, but wants to be nation. Italy, I don't know what it lives, we can discuss that, but also wants to be empire. Um, so, um, and I, I, I should say, actually, it was it our, our second speaker, uh, Pam Ballinger, I, Emily, was, but so, a second or third, yeah, <laughs> second, I think. Oh. Yeah, so <laughs> we, we are, we are, we are um, you know. You are all becoming Italianists against your we are, we are We are specialists on this region. Um, <laughs> no. um, but uh, it's so, so she, her, her new book deals with the afterlife of another, this, this other empire, the Italian empire, which, which isn't just in the region you're, discussion, you're discussing, but also uh, right, uh, Abyssinia. So, the Eastern Mediterranean colonies, the African colonies, etc., um, and, and so there, there's an, another post-imperial story. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering if there's an, and again, this is a very wide open question, and I, I guess there, there are many ways of thinking about it. But is is there any way that you you think we can wonder about Fiume post-empire one <laughs> in relationship to the fact that it is sort of entering a nation state that wants to be an empire or and I'm never sure about these categories. But I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you to complicate it. <laughs> um, and, 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 then a, and then an empire that again falls apart. Um, and finally, we get to a, a history of a, of, a, of a city called Rijeka, not Fiume, Fiume anymore. Um, so, so I wonder if, if, that, if, if, if there is a way of connecting these, 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 this doubling that we're seeing here, actually, of these post imperialists. <laughs> There's so many things I want to say about this. First things first, they do think of Italy as an empire in 1990. Italy is trying to be an empire. Italy already is an empire. It's, you know, the Dodecanese Islands, <laughs> you know, it is, it, it, Libya, it is an empire. And it wants to keep on being one. And so it's not, they're not, they're not reading the, the news wrong, they're reading the news. That's why I, I don't like the Wilsonian moment, that book, because I, people are reading uh, a chance of getting out of empire because that's what they want to see. They've not been duped into thinking that because they could, if they don't want to see that, they can just look at the news. <laughs> so so that's, that's the reason why I, I just don't understand that book that well. I do think that you can think about the end of World War I as the end of empire if you want empire to end. But if you don't want empire to end, you can look at the end of World War I as let's get to the new world. And I think that's what my guys are. They have no desire for empire to end. They make their, all their money on empire. <laughs> and they have no desire to be colonized. They want even more power than people do in a nation state. They think of empire as power, not as being like subservient or whatever. So they think of it as a paycheck. What happens after World War II is totally different. Their empire didn't disappear. Their, dis their empire literally got kicked out. <laughs> and then they got bombed to smithereens. The reason why I don't have World War I that much in my book is because World War I and Fiume is kind of 
you know, it's it, they lose a lot of rights, they get really hungry, trade gets bad, but they're not a site of the war. World War II? <laughs> uh, yeah, they are. So, so you know, telling what happens after World War II is so completely different. It's, it's miserable, it's heartbreaking, uh, tens of thousands of people fleeing all different directions. Why? Well, because they had a completely different war and they had a completely different empire and they're getting a totally different state. So it, 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 it is useful to see how, did, how is today's Rijeka part of post-Empire Fiume 1 and post-Empire Fiume 2? I love that question. But it, they're, not, they're, not, they're not at the same table anymore and they haven't been at the same party. It's not a party after World War II. No one is going to write a book called Festa della Rivoluzione, the, the, the party of the revolution, talking about World War II in, in Rieca Fiume. So, so I, I, you know, I, I brought this up, I don't know, one of the other talks. I really don't think that anyone should think about post-World War I Fiume as kind of emblematic of Fiume's history. It's very, very emblematic of Fiume's history after 1867 until 1921. Thereafter, things just keep on changing. And I, I find it very, very dangerous to think of this like pragmatic, multi-ethnic town that's you know just trying to make money. There's a lot of ideological and ethnic politics going on that is different as the world gets harder and meaner. Dominique, we have uh, we only have a few more minutes um, of our, and we have one more uh, really fantastic question that came in from Natasha Wheatley, who congratulates you on a wonderful presentation. Um, and she says that listening to you on changing and layered sovereignty and the scale of the city and the status of the free port city, she's wondering if you had thought about Danzig as an interesting parallel to Fiume. Um, and then she sort of describes why that will be, and we'll post that for you to see, but and she wonders if we could experiment with the idea of the new international order as told through the scale or space of these port cities, either comparatively or in an entangled history. And might we think about Fiume in a broader global history of autonomous port cities? So I am not an expert of uh, Gdansk Danzig, uh, so I might say a lot of wrong things. And, and a lot of people bring up these two cities together. I mean, they're being brought up together in the peace conference. I mean, they're, they're literally, let's do a dancing, you know, like, let's do a few. I mean, this is, this is, from the beginning, they are thought of as a similar story. Uh, but they aren't. They aren't. Uh, Fiume is between two Entente winners. Mm -hmm. Italy and Serbia. And uh, Gdansk Danzig is... I mean, maybe Poland is a winner, but it, it's not a state before World War I. So it's, it's, it, Serbia is a state. It's a winner. It's the one that got the why World War I began. <laughs> you know, so, so it's, it's, a, it's a contested area between a loser and a non-entity before. And Fiume is between two of the winners who are both convinced that they're getting screwed. <laughs> So, so it, 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 even just in, in diplomatic terms, what's going on at the peace treaty, the reason why Fiume is the trigger for the walkout and not Danzig is only because they're both Entente winners and they both are convinced they're the victims of their win. So, uh, so I, I think it's very different. Also, it's much more mixed Fiume than Danzig is. It's a new city. Danzig is not a new city. It's a much, Danzig's a much bigger city. It's a much more, in many ways, more important city. But, but Fiume is a boom town. <laughs> the reason why Fiume is so much more mixed isn't because of centuries of being a Hansestadt. It's because it's, it's, it's a new town made by Hungary in which everyone's like, ooh, I want a job. It's a gold rush of, of you know, Alison Frank Johnson's here, of, of the oil train. <laughs> it's a gold rush of the torpedo train. It's a gold rush of the tobacco train. It's a gold rush of being a new industrial port with the newest technologies modeled on Marseille. 20 years before, it wasn't that. And it wasn't that mixed the way it became. So how it's lived on the ground, and that's what I'm doing, is totally different. How it's lived diplomatically is totally different. 
But I do know that a good friend of mine who's very, very smart is co-authoring an article, Marco Bresciani, on looking at, uh, I think he's looking at Trieste Danzig, and maybe he's bringing some fume, I don't know. But one way or the other, these are useful questions, but when I get them, when I get them, I always think about how different they are, not of how similar they are. Ari just reminded me that we go till 1.15. For somehow in my head, I thought we were going till one o'clock. So we <laughs> actually have time to read through a number of uh, the other wonderful questions that we've got. Ari, do you want to pick up on the next one? <laughs> You're like, uh, sure. <laughs> yes, yes, no, I will. And, and, and I, I have to say, that I'm, I'm really grateful that, that we, we got that question about the, the, those points. Hey, Natasha Wheatley is, is no slouch. <laughs> yes, and, and 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 I think I think we all have our our go-to places in our mind, and, and indeed there's such a old history of those Hamburg. I mean, as other hand, the cities it doesn't have to be post World War One. It's just the way they are incorporated in the 19th century in in these um, states with the ambition of being nation states is, is fascinating, and they don't they're not just port cities. The only other corpus separatum construct that I know of is, is Jerusalem, also. Uh, Colossal failure um, <laughs> as a construct. <laughs> Maybe not only, but <laughs> I'm mean, here as a, as a as a as a legal project. <laughs> um, but I thought uh, maybe maybe I'll I'll take two questions that I'll together that that appeared. Um, uh, one from somebody who unfortunately is anonymized for us, but um, I, I, and. From the way the question is asked, doesn't know that I believe. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure. So, and, and those are both questions that basically want you to return to the part you don't want to. You're trying to de-emphasize, and that's the Denuncio story and and the, the the legionnaires. So, so one is 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 not anonymous, and that that's from uh, Simon Sulam. Uh, I was just asking you to 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 to. Well, he's sort of basically pushing back to the depoliticization of the moment that he sees when, when you do that. Um, and the, the sort of nationalism and militarism that, that's involved when these uh, it, Italians and this whole hodgepodge of, of people are, are sort of descending on the city. Um, and then there's another one, and this is the anonymous question uh, from somebody who said they've learned from you <laughs> about Monica Black's work about uh, mass supernatural phenomena uh, after mass violence and after wars. And the question is if we can connect the Danunzio story with this general sense of, of, of super, the supernatural and, and, and you mentioned the imperial ghost story. So, so to what degree are the Danunzios an imperial ghost story and to what degree is that imperial ghost story that's back to Simon, uh, to what degree do we have to still think about that, in spite of the fact that we now know so much more about what this moment really means for, for, for this place and what, what we can learn from it? I think that um, it's really, uh, I, I don't know if you see that I've been playing fast and loose on numbers. And the, the part of the reason why I don't really, can't really say how many legionnaires is because it's just constantly changing. And one of the reasons why it's changing is not because more and more people are coming, although that's true at the beginning, but so many leave. And why they come is not why they stay. A lot of people leave because what they thought Danuncio was and what Danuncio is, is so different. And so this thinking about the supernatural and what the what the link is between the trauma and the need for a meaning of all of this, right? And, and, and that having that guy who gave voice to pride and talked about death and talked about spirit and talked a lot about martyrdom. He was really into martyrdoms is deeply related to all the violence of World War I. But then they would get there and he didn't think it was going to last as long as it did. He thought it was going to be a couple of weeks and then we're out, you know, Italian government, they fall. Um, it didn't, it just kept on going. And so then all of a sudden this, this idea you had, you're living with it, kind of, you know, and you notice all of the real there, the, all the human, and it becomes less supernatural. And it's really fascinating how, um, how the, so many of these men 
leave because they they feel dirtied by what the day to day is of the fume crisis of what their role is there. Not everyone. Some people become even more convinced, right? Um, but uh, the, the 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 no one knows how many people were there. But they do think that the height of it was around December, two months after, so December 1919. And that from that moment on, it's just a trickle down of people leaving. And a lot of it is because they love their king. And all of a sudden, Danuncio calls a regency. Uh, they love this. And they're, they're like, I don't want to be a socialist. I mean, it, 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 as, as he keeps on trying to come stay in the news, so he's, they, you know, Fiume means this, and then more people leave. Fiume means this, now more people leave. They, they, they went there for what World War I brought them there for. So I think that that question about the supernatural is really important. And then it's the lived that doesn't know what to do with the supernatural. Once he's dead, it's incredible about how he means what he meant in September 1919. And that's why so many people dislike me is because a lot of Italians still really love that guy. Young, young Italians, uh, they read him, he's required reading in school. Uh, everybody has to read him in a way that no American curriculum would ever make us read Walt Whitman. And so it, it's incredible how loved he is. I hate him. We have a question from Mark Evans, uh, which sort of shifts our direction a little bit toward Yugoslavia. Um, and you've talked a lot about how, you know, we have these kind of contested historiographies, right? One side, Croatia or Yugoslavia for much of the 20th century had one idea of what had happened and Italy had another. And we often see that with these contested spaces, that there's different historiographical um, sort of languages and narratives that emerge around them. Um, what Mark wonders is if you could talk a little bit more about state relations and foreign policy. Um, and given Fiume's sort of economic potential, was there a Yugoslav response? Um, and, you know, what was it? And was this response muted because it seemed like it was a lost cause? Um, how do you understand Yugoslavia as part of this story? Well, I mean, so I, I, I give, I've been talking about this book since I thought of this book. And what I've always noticed is how amazing it is that everyone assumes Wilson would be on the Italian side. The, the whole point is Wilson doesn't want Fiume to go to Italy. Why does he have an opinion about this? Partially, he doesn't want a monopoly on the Adriatic. He does not want Italy to control all the ports. But he is, and Larry Wolf's new book about Woodrow Wilson is absolutely important in thinking about how Eastern European policymakers and politicians are trying to get the ear of the president. Well, one of the most successful are the Serbs, <laughs> who, 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 who have, a, a, oh, I forgot his name, the geographer, they, they, they literally create the narrative about the economic necessity that the kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes has of having Fiume. And, and they create reams of paper and, and publicity and yellow journalism and all of this to explain that without Fiume, the kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes is going to be, is going to be jailed in pre-industrialism. They need the railways, they need the port. There is no railway to split. Like there, there is so, and and there are discussions at the Paris Peace Conference. If we don't give Fiume to to uh, SHS to to the King of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, then we need to build a railway to a port, split or Baca or. I mean, no one's really talking about Zadar, but the, <laughs> because it's going to Italy. But the the, the point is, is that um, the Serbs and I'm saying Serbs here on purpose, are very, very effective at trying to get Fiume to be added to the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes. Croatians are also pushing for the uh, uh, Fiume to be added to the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, but they just don't have as much a voice in Paris 
as the Serbs do. And, and their arguments are also about money, but they're also about identity. And so then those identity arguments become he said, she said. Right, so then you know, the Italians create their statistics that everyone's Italian, and then they create their statistics that everyone's Croatian. The lived on the ground relations between these states, Fiume and the Kingdom of Serbs and Slovenes, and I published an article very short in the Slavic Review about this, is looking at what's happening to the Habsburg crown, the Austrian crown, compared to the Serb dinar. So Croatia Slavonia is getting a four to one exchange rate with the dinar for the new Yugoslav currency. And before the war, it was one to one. And Fiume doesn't want that. They want one to one with the Italian lira, which was what the Austrian crown was before the war. What they, that's what the government's telling them annexation means. That doesn't happen. They get 2.5 to one. But still, 2.5 to 1 is a lot better than 4 to 1. So thinking about what Croatia Savonia's relationship is with Serbia in terms of all of these problems of what is the law, what is currency, what is that, is something that people in Fiume and Sushak are reading about. So Ital uh, Slavic nationalists are all about, like, we don't want to be under Italy. We just went through war. They were evil on the fronts. They were. I mean, there's a lot of Slavophobia that we've lived out in brutal bodily terms. But what's happening in terms of state making in the Kingdom of Serbs, Cross and Slovenes is not a, a, a dream come true for Croatia, Slavonia. And I think that unless you're a nationalist, you don't want the four to one. And I, John Paul Newman's book on the on how the two armies get put together is also a useful reminder of this is a tough transition. It's not all about identity. Well, we thank you very much, Dominique, for this wonderful talk. We have some other questions that have come in that we will send along to you. We apologize to those of you whose questions we couldn't answer live today, but out of respect for everybody's time and Zoom fatigue, we want to make sure we, we close. Um, we thank you for writing this terrific book. Um, I strongly encourage everyone to read it. Anyone has any concentration to read right now? <laughs> Um, Ari, uh, do you want to say something? In closing? No, no, I just, I just really want to thank you too again, uh, both for this incredibly, you know, you're such a wonderful presenter too. So, so <laughs> if, if you like the presentation, that's it's the exact same energy, and uh, that 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 you will discover in the book if you haven't yet read it. And I know yeah, many many experts in the field on and in, in our <laughs> group of at at attendees here who who might know the book, but but if if you don't know the book yet, at at, at exactly. Um, has uh, you know that 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 voice in it that that you will that you will enjoy I'm sure. Yeah, let's so. out. Yeah, this is the part where we all encourage you who are in Europe to go have a glass of wine, and for those of you in uh, the East Coast and the Midwest to either pick Not up yet, early. <laughs> to, to, to pick up your children from their bedrooms upstairs where they're <laughs> studying across a computer. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you thank to you. all of you who attended. It was great to see you. We look forward to seeing you again. Bye-bye. <laughs> Goodbye.